just watched because it absolutely wasn't a Cinderella. And I, you, you, you were the one that said we should do this one first. I remember distinctly. I just thought that we could be culturally relevant. It was coming out. It was good timing. I saw the trailer and I was curious. Weren't you curious after that trailer? I think after the first trailer, I was curious, but after the second and third, I was just deeply terrified. And I just want to say, I think that this evens us out from my Yeshen debacle. I think we're even now. Wow, that bad. Well, it went on forever. Okay, I do think it was nearly two hours. I, it was a hundred years. Every time I checked the clock, it was still a half hour left. It was a time loop. Um, hi guys. Welcome back to the Cinderella podcast. We are so happy to be back. It's Hello. been a whole month. Yay. For you. For you. For us, we- who knows how time works anymore. Time doesn't exist for us anymore. We've descended into some weird non-time dimension. So what are we doing here? This is our second season of the Cinderella podcast. The premise of this podcast is that together, Talon and I watch and review every Cinderella adaptation we can get our hands on, discussing the same story over and over until we slowly go insane. It's not always the same story. Sometimes it's a very different story. I'm Talon. (laughs) uh, I'm Liv. Sorry. I can't. I need to try again. Okay. This has scrambled my brain. Listen, she's Liv. I'm Talon. Today we watched Cinderella, made in 2021. We're going to call it the Jukebox Musical Cinderella because that's what it was. Oh, yeah. Also, it was a lot. Because we already had a please stop singing Cinderella, so we had to come up with something else. So uh, let's just. Let's have a little bit of trivia. Talon, I don't know what kind of trivia you dug up before we watched this, but I found a couple of gems. Oh, please. So IMDb has given this 3.6 out of 10 stars. Oof, that's Um, fair. The queen in this movie is Minnie Driver, who plays the fairy godmother in Ella Enchanted, Mm -hmm. which, no spoilers, we hate. (laughs) <laughs> it's awful if you like it i am so sorry we disagree we just uh, we both read the book at a formative age and then we're incredibly disappointed by the movie and then watched the movie again as adults and we're incredibly disappointed by it again and now it just looms over us because we watched it before we started the podcast and we just we know we're gonna have to watch it again yep and so the hate just builds I've got something really lovely planned for the episode after that, though. Oh, good. It's going to be the we'll Penguin episode. No. <laughs> We're going to watch Ella Enchanted and then the tender tale of Cinderella Penguin. I don't know if we should. Anyway, we should. We, so, do you have more trivia? Yes. So one of the 150 songs in this is also Somebody to Love, which is also in Ella Enchanted. Yes. Uh, Kay Cannon, who is the writer and director also was the I think writer director for Pitch Perfect interesting which sort of makes sense because Pitch Perfect had a sort of meta vibe to it but it also kind of made sense that it would be sort of meta and culturally relevant because it was set in a college campus and not a fashion universe that exists outside the bounds of time and space we'll get to it we'll get to it last one the cinematographer for this movie was the same cinematographer who shot Ever After and I want to know what happened to that person. Oh, man. Because it was lovely cinematography, but it was shot like an action movie, just spinning around and around and around and close-ups and zooms and mad. I just... Mm. I have a piece of trivia. Please, I don't want to start talking about this. <laughs> so in a lot of the write-ups about this, they say that Missy Elliott is supposed to be the town crier. She is not the town crier. It's somebody else. Um, I think they said Doc Brown in the credits. But I would have loved to have Missy Elliott be the town crier in this. I want to live in that universe. I hated the town crier. So yes, much. me too. <laughs> so we this is to a Cinderella movie. We it's have to start. 
I, I just started. This is me starting. So this is, <laughs> Liv, get it together. <laughs> okay, go, I'm, I'm good. So this is a Cinderella movie. It's live action. It's an Amazon Prime original. If you want to watch it, it's streaming now, I guess. Spoiler, we don't recommend it. Don't, we don't. You don't, don't have to watch it. We watched it. I regret that decision. Yeah. Yep. So we start out with a shot of the sky, and you see this purple butterfly, and we get the narration by our fairy god person. This is our I think. fabulous godparent, is how they are um, in the credits and how they are introduced. It is also written into the trivia that this is our first non-binary fairy godparent. I am perfectly happy for this fairy godparent to be non-binary, uh, but they don't ever actually use any pronouns. So it's not actually clear. They're dressed in a very fabulous way eventually, but um, I'm just saying if they wanted to do a non-bi person, they should have put something about pronouns in there. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I would say that this is a very gender non-conforming fairy godparent, and I would leave it at that. Yes, um, absolutely. They're played by Billy Porter of Poe's fame. So that's who our narrator is, and everything they say is like the biggest, most exciting proclamation ever made, and it gets really old really fast. Really old. So the voiceover intro goes, once upon a time, there was an old-fashioned kingdom, and everyone had their part to play, and they played it without question, and the world was about to change, and then Billy Porter laughs maniacally. <laughs> the fairy godparent goes on to say that the village was full of hardworking citizens that moved to the same beat, and this is their cue to start singing, which happens approximately every five minutes in this movie. And they mm -hmm. sing Rhythm Nation, and it's a really multicultural cast. And they're all doing like dance moves while they're doing villager things. And yeah, I have so many notes about this scene. Oh, thank God, because that was the end of mine. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, there's a butterfly on the screen. Uh, spoilers the butterfly is going to be the symbol for the fairy godparent. The butterfly wings flapping have a special effect sound added to them that sounds like dragon wings. It sounds like the leathery wings of fiery death are beating down upon you. Every time we see a winged insect in this movie, they will give you the leathery dragon wing sound effect. And <sighs> this opening number very much felt like they were trying to do the, the prince is giving a ball village dance number from the Brandy Cinderella. This movie wants to be the Brandy Cinderella, but oh, modern wants so bad. So badly. So this is absolutely what that scene was. Villagers are caring about with their works. It's very multicultural. They're wearing a lot of very colorful clothes from various periods in history, which we'll get to. The milkmaids are carrying 1930s milk canisters, which are these big metal cylinders with sort of a cone on top and then a smaller cylinder for gathering milk they weld shut. Garth bought one to make lead paint in. Um, mm. So I have one in my living room right now. They're doing this rhythm nation thing with a lot of different items that they're being rhythmic. One of the items is a circle saw. Interesting. A circle, someone's doing rhythmic jazz uh, music stuff with a circle saw which a that's not safe don't do that b when is this set oh none of it made sense i couldn't even possibly begin to answer that question but not even like okay so mirror mirror is just set in a fantasy world that is in no space and time and the costumes are outrageous and don't exist in any period in history but they're internally consistent they, this is a culture that has, you know, certain things and not other things. They have not reached a certain point in the Industrial Revolution. And this culture is, is everywhere in the Industrial Revolution at the same time. <sighs> Don't think about it too hard. I can't stop. So then we get the introduction to Vivian, our stepmother, who's played by Dina Manzel, which I am going to say was a poor casting choice because she's too good to be like wedged into a tiny role. So they had to expand her role and now the movie doesn't make any sense. Agreed. 
they're, they call her a practical woman and say that this is after the death of her second husband. So we have the very traditional Cinderella setup in which she has two daughters, uh, Melvolia, who is described as obnoxious, and Narcissa, who is described as self-absorbed. And then we get an aside from the fairy godparent saying she's cray. And then also, um, yeah, they can be a lot. So here's the problem. I was so excited about a gender non-conforming fairy godparent. But they are so modern and so out of tone with mm -hmm. even the modernisms of this movie. Because part of this movie will take place in a period drama, a, a lighthearted period drama. And part of it will take place now on a college campus on a theater set. And the fairy godparent is just God knows where not in tone with either of those things. And it was really frustrating. So I was really, 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 really wanting to like them. Yeah, I was very excited. And then I saw the trailer and I was no longer excited. Yeah, excitement was replaced with dread. And then I watched so, it and I was definitely no longer excited. So we're still having this aggressive voiceover. It's been several minutes. And the fairy godparent explains that uh, in their basement lives Cinderella, whose real name is Ella. She's called Cinderella because her skin is smudged. It's not. Her skin is never smudged. We never see a speck of dirt on her skin, although they tell us we do several times. Didn't appreciate it. And explains that the stepsisters have given her that nickname because they aren't very smart. And she's dreaming of a world that's different from her own. Mm -hmm. And she rolls onto a pin like a dressmaking pen and wakes up. Yeah. She then begins aggressively singing. Just aggressively singing and rescuing a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. She's very energetic in the way she sings, which I noticed right away. And she kind of maintains 110% energy level throughout the entire movie, which I think is a very questionable choice, especially for Cinderella. At one point in this intro song, she does finger guns into the mirror. At herself. At herself. She also hip checks a cast iron stove with a fire lit, which don't do that. Cast iron stoves have a pretty good heat transference. Don't touch them. So she's saying you gotta be, but they're still kind of saying rhythm nation interspersed into it. So this movie does a lot of songs sung over one another. And I gotta say, they do it, they really put their all into it. And if you're going to do some really intense mashups like that, you got to double and triple down, and they did. I didn't like it, but they really went for it. It was creative and enthusiastically done. They really leaned into it. They didn't half-ass it. We then get the first instance of the three CGI mice oh, who, God. who were singing <laughs> and talked to her you don't know right now if she can hear that, if she can talk to them or not. You find out later that they can understand her and talk to her, but she cannot understand them. I have, I hate it. They squeak in rhythm, kill me now in my notes. Okay, so they're voiced by three British comedians that I actually really like. James Acaster, James Corden, and Rama Shranganathan. And... They're so poorly shoehorned into the smoothie that it's always oh. really awkward. Every time they show up, they like kill a scene, basically. Whatever momentum that scene had, it's gone. It's just the movie grinds to grinds a screeching, to a screeching halt. halt. Oh. So that we could see like mouse antics. Okay. And it's so painful because I really like these comedians. Oh yeah, no, this was really frustrating. We also have not described what anybody looks like, so let's let's do that now. Let's do that. All right. Well, Cinderella is played by Camilla Cabello, who is young, beautiful. She's a singer. She's very in right now. You probably know who she is. But if you're listening to this eons in the future, she's beautiful. She has long, dark hair. She is a uh, Latin American, so she... Uh, does not look stereotypically white, which is wonderful. She's wearing some real weird choices. She's wearing a corset from the 1700s, the, like about the 1750s. It's very accurate. 
courses from the 1750s were supposed to make you conical. They were not supposed to enhance your boobs. So they don't look like what we think of as like, oh, that's a corset because those are sort of 1840s corsets. She's wearing a 1750s corset over like a chemise. She's got a triple belt wound around her waist as they did in the 1300s. And she's got a skirt from the 1880s. So my, my temporal confusion continues unabated. I thought that this would sort of settle as the movie progressed. It does not. She also wears her hair in this very loose braid. And this is her sort of signature look. And there's stuff in her braid. She's got like buttons or beads or something in her braid. So uh, the stepsisters, Narcissa is the tall one. She has lighter hair. It is alternately sort of blonde and mid-brown. Couldn't really get a hold of it. She's taller. She's very pale. She's kind of ditzy. She's very into herself as her character beat. Yeah. Malvolia is plumper and shorter with very dark hair and very pale skin and she is a riot. She's a hoot. I liked her. Yeah, her thing is that she's just, she'll just say what people Whatever are thinking. She, yeah. Or what she's thinking. Yeah, she's but. just very intense, not afraid to like what she likes, not afraid to say that she likes it. And the stepmother is, has sort of mm, auburny red hair. It's done up in tight curls and sort of a high updo thing. It's always very tight and controlled. Her Her whole demeanor is just very tightly coiled. I don't know how else to describe it. So the song blessedly ends as Ella brings the breakfast to her step family and continues to finish the song that was just being sung for reasons that defy understanding. She brings them tea and the stepmother is very like displeased by it and she basically says imagine if you serve such swill to your husband and that if she had her husband would abandon her just like everybody else because she's worthless and it would lead to a life on the street. And then she goes, you could be so pretty if you took even a second to comb that hair of yours. And at this point, the stepsisters both lean back behind their mother and critique what just happened. So Narcissa says, that was a little harsh. And Mavoli goes, I think that could have been harsher. And then uh, Vivian goes, girls. And they both sit back up in exact unison and stare at Cinderella again. And it was a cute comedy beat. It was a nice little physical moment of comedy, but it was weird. It didn't make any sense. It was just a little bit too metatextual. And it really was a very like startlingly harsh thing that she said to, to Ella. Yeah. Out, of, so, out of nowhere. This is the first time we've heard Vivian speak. Yeah. And this is what she opens with. And again, she gets a lot of screen time. Like, a lot of screen time. So mm. it was a choice. Yeah. And they also, uh, no spoilers, they're going to try to do the thing that uh, Ever After did, where they make the stepmother sort of a human character instead of just being a caricature of evil. But they don't remember this until about three quarters of the way through the movie. So for the first 75%, she's just a caricature of evil and meanness and has no personality other than evil meanness and mean evilitude. I wish they kept it that way, honestly. Or if they were going to the other way, put some of that other context in earlier. You could have done, there There was a lot of time that we could have spent doing something other than singing. My God. The Wikipedia lists 14 separate songs and that doesn't count any of like the town crier songs or any of the shorter, this what? is like what's happening. No, no, I... Because here's the thing, I'm going to have to go through and click through this and get the song time so that I can put these numbers into my spreadsheet to see how much percentage of this movie was song. So I'm going to have to do this again. You don't have to. I mean, faster. No, I need to know how much of this was song. <laughs> I need to know, Talon. I have to know. So anyway, Ugh. the scene is interrupted by Thomas, who's brought them veggies and has come to smile awkwardly and be weird at all of the daughters in the family. Yes. You can't really tell who he's flirting with. He's just talking about the vegetables. They're all root vegetables that he's brought. And he's like, yes, the fleshiest fruit of the earth. 
yeah he's clearly supposed to be played as kind of a gross character but they don't play that up enough so he just comes across as sort of weirdly flirting he has very big teeth and kind of like smiles aggressively and he has a cane which is implied to just be for effect and that's yes. basically all that we got of him cinderella and narcissa are not into him he makes but, their uh, skin crawl they make it but malvolio malvolio is like i'm into it <laughs> which like it also leads to a pretty solid line the stepmother is celebrating that her daughters have a suitor and Malvolio goes, well, I have a suitor. The other ones have jealousy. It's great. Um, it's a funny moment. So Cinderella goes downstairs and begins to sing again because we just escaped a musical number, but now we have another one. And she begins to drape fabric just sort of around. She's fantasizing about her dresses and her future self and this dress that she's going to make, which is all guys i don't know how to describe it it's pink mermaid scale she's got this pink mermaid scale bodice dress with pink tulle and it's a weird dress and this is the if it's a million to one song yes and mm -hmm. i i gotta write down some of the lyrics because i don't i get that song lyrics are supposed to be more evocative than literal but if it's a shot in the dark i'm gonna be the sun what I can't afford to be wrong even when I'm afraid. That doesn't mean anything. You're going to know my name. What? I. Those are images that sort of go together like the dark and the sun, but a shot in the dark is a wild guess and the sun doesn't help your markmanship. And it doesn't matter if you're afraid whether you're wrong or right. That Fear has no relevance on whether or not you're wrong and that has no bearing on whether or not they're going to know your name. And the mice sigh, and I sigh too, and I regretted not going to find an adult beverage. <laughs> There's a moment where she imagines herself running a dress shop in the future, and she's there wearing her current clothes, but she's also there as her future self wearing this beautiful flowery pink dress. And then she's just singing at herself, to herself, like, the future version and the past version saying you're gonna know my name which i thought was such a misstep yeah because she should have been singing it to a crowd yes or, or the concept of singing to your future self or your past self is a cool concept but this was a very weird use of it and i don't think that it hit right for me this was very much a miss this was not an emotional inspiring moment this uh this missed me absolutely if that's what they were trying to do our Cinderella also sings the song while running aggressively around her room. She's oh, no. just, she's very energetic. God bless her. She's just full of vibrancy and nonstop, nonstop energy, nonstop energy. And she just runs around the room, jumps on the bed, spins around. And I just, this is going to sound so messed up, but I like to see Cinderella like a little beaten down at some point just so yeah. that she can rise just so she can rise yeah but she already started out at 110 percent, and there's nowhere left to her for her to go there's not other than down that's 100 percent agree you have to have an underdog there's no there's no point of an underdog story if you don't start with an underdog otherwise you just have not that which is also what we got we got a not that story so no. we now are done with that scene thank god and we cut to the palace where someone is drinking grossly just slurping a beverage and then this is this is princess laura we find out eventually this is princess laura and she is holding up a world map and she is talking to someone who is sitting there looking stupid and dumb with this some dude dumb dude bros behind him we find out later this is the prince and i was really disappointed because i was hoping this wasn't the prince I mean, immediately it was obvious it was the prince. I love that the prince had his like terrible friends. That's actually something that I really enjoy is when the prince has some terrible friends to be just like a near do well with. I think that's very charming. I mean, I like that. I like that if you're gonna have, if you're gonna be a near do well prince, have near do well friends, do near do well stuff with them. That's fine. We've got a we've got a check Cinderella coming up that has a bunch of near do well princes and friends, and we're excited about that one because it's actually a good step. So Princess Laura is holding up 
a world map and she's explaining to him very slowly as one does for a child that this is a map of the world this blob is our blob this blob is your blob and if we marry we can join our blobs and we will rule the lands all the way down to the sea monster so i make fantasy maps in my spare time i enjoyed the sea monster theme more than i should have i like that so he is not into her she is also very masculine presenting uh i mean she's she's in a gown um i think but it's a very we only see it from the waist up and so it looks like she's wearing sort of a suit very large collars very tightly pulled back hair and the prince goes uh no i you know i'd love to marry you but i can't i'm too busy to be looking over foreign lands and she responds with busy doing what you spent the last three days drinking and foxing and he proceeds to retort well do you know how hard it is to catch a fox when you're drunk and then his douchey friends throw apples at him and they get into an apple throwing fight in a palace room in front of a princess who sort of stops the fight and goes we don't have to do anything together i will be in charge of all the military stuff and all the world planning if you have the actual quote feel free to interrupt me no okay um and we wouldn't have to talk except for you know military planning stuff and this and the disgusting business of creating children or something like that that's exactly right thank you okay so uh, he dismisses her and she walks past a line of princesses saying not much upstairs and i'd be surprised if it was different downstairs if you get my meaning and she winks at one of the princesses as she walks past and then we just leave that as though it didn't happen we're just done with this line of princesses for some reason and we are introduced for the first time to the town crier the town crier raps he raps all of the news of the kingdom at us multiple times in the movie and i didn't like it it's the most annoying exposition dump Ever. He introduces himself and then mentions that the previous guy used to be Gary, but now it's him, and that Gary died of dysentery. And that's the kind of rap it is, the kind that rhymes Gary with dysentery. So here's the thing. A, it's not just the town crier, he has a whole group with him. They're all dressed in band uniforms. I okay, wrote, I thought that was cool. Quote, faux military outfits, but they're just band uniforms they're all black which okay that's fine i it's weird that that's a rap group and you're doing i just i I didn't so this rap is very they were really trying to be hamilton this whole thing was very like no hamilton was awesome we're gonna try to rap modernly about old-timey stuff and rhyme dysentery with things one of them is playing an electric violin y'all an electric violin i can't, you can't play an electric violin without wires and speakers because it's electric it's like a guitar it has to have it's not a okay what's the next I, I didn't mind it i thought it was cute I, they're all wearing like very like trim black like you said pseudo-military like band uniforms they look kind of like a drum line I was into it. I just wasn't a big fan of the exposition wrapping because it was really clunky and really cheesy. But what the what the information that they impart to us is that there's going to be a royal changing of the guard and that the king and queen and their children will be there. Yeah. And that's it. But so, it's a very long scene. It's such a long scene. So we cut back to the manor and the stepsisters are uh Malvolia is pinching narcissus cheeks uh, aggressively to see if they're red enough to get them to be redder because everyone's going to the changing of the guard and narcissus asks if they're nearly done because this pain is very intense i feel you narcissus girl i feel you <laughs> so they they scream for cinderella for a long time they scream for her for minutes um which i liked because the theme of we call for Cinderella and she instantly drops whatever she's doing and races to attend you. Yeah, I don't love that, you know? 
So I liked that she was busy with her own thing downstairs in the basement, which I want to talk about this basement when we get a chance. But it's they're just dress making, by the way. What she's busy with is making a dress. Yeah, because that's her goal. She wants to be a businesswoman. She wants to make dresses. She wants to have so they, her own shop. Yeah. So they scream for her for a long time, and she eventually shows up and goes, you called? And they were like, yes. Yes, that child. Don't be dense. <laughs> so they they give us this exposition dump that they're going to the changing of the guard and that everyone's going to be there and they have to get ready and Narcissa says do I look pretty and this is one of the scenes in the commercial it says do I look pretty and Cinderella goes I think you do but honestly who cares what I think what matters is how you feel which is a great concept I don't know why you chose to waste it on this character in this moment but that's a good sentiment I hated it so Narcissa looks at herself in the mirror for a long time and finally and just sort of makes a bunch of weird faces that look kind of dumb and finally goes yeah I I feel pretty and then sort of meets Cinderella's gaze and goes you have dirt on your face but she doesn't she doesn't have any dirt on her face her face is clean if you're gonna make such a big point about somebody having a dirty face get a smidgen of smudge and put a smudge on their face I could it would have been so easy just to put smudges on her face. Okay, Danielle in Ever After is genuinely dirty multiple times. She has smudges on her forehead. She has streaks on her dress. Uh, this Cinderella will be dressed in her corset is bone white and her underdress tunic thing is pure white. None of them ever have a speck on them. They are never smudged. They are never dirty. We never see her doing any chores that would involve getting dirty, like cleaning out a fireplace or scrubbing floors or uh, doing anything with farm animals. I think it's time to talk about the basement. You guys, okay. the basement is beautiful. It's well it's, lit. It's got giant windows. It has, so it's an underground, it's one of those um, sort of half basements that sort of London houses have where the bottom level of the house is all windows that go into a basement so it's just filled with light there's more light in this basement than there is in my entire house i don't have that many windows in my house so there's always just light streaming in from everywhere and it's airy and spacious with a high ceiling and multiple rooms it's a beautiful loft apartment is what it is she's living in a glorious loft apartment that happens to be a basement they also met, mentioned that it's a good thing that nobody ever goes down there except for her. Um, so it's kind of her like little oasis and all of her sketches for her dresses are up on a wall and all of her dressmaking materials are just sort of out. I completely missed that because I was so mad. So Cinderella's ready to go with them, but she's got a dress with her and she wants to sell the dress. Mm hmm and she doesn't seem to have a plan that's very specific, but she made a dress. She's going to try and sell it. And her stepmother gets very mad at her and tells her that it's insane that a girl would try to put herself in matters of business, that she's embarrassing the household with her blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And she tops it all off with every girl is worth more when she smiles. Ooh, the evilest line in the whole thing. I'm going to go with right there. That was the most evil smile. Yes. And then, of course, the two stepsisters smile on cue. Mm -hmm. And she tells her to put the dress down, and Cinderella does. And then we cut to the king and queen. The king, by the way, is played by Pierce Brosnan in all his glory. So uh, he was kind of fun. I, yeah. I enjoyed the king and queen. I, I, I did, but I didn't. I had mixed feelings about them so the queen goes what are you doing and pierce brosnan with just a fierce stare directly down camera lens goes i am stewing in my own anger <laughs> and he is uh, in a audience with his son the prince whose name is robert roger yes. Roderick? robert robert it's robert it was so bland i couldn't tell the king is furious that he has rejected princess laura's suit of marriage because he would have had control over all the Terries up until the sea monster <laughs> um 
not a lot happens in this scene. The queen, this is the first time we get this mention of the king has made his throne taller. Just slightly. And the queen points it out and she goes, is your chair taller than yesterday? And the king goes, no, it's not, don't be silly. And if it is, so what? I'm the king. And uh, the queen leaves with the to line. To go brush her hair until it all falls out. Yep, with that line. She's and not doing prince, great. <laughs> no, she's not. She's not doing well. And the prince goes, okay, we done? Because I got a thing. Which is just so out of tone from the rest of whatever the scene was, which wasn't an old historic speak, but also wasn't in, okay, we done? Because I got a thing. The, the tone just shifts dramatically from instant to instant and it's very disruptive. The main thing we find out from the scene is that the prince actually has a sister named Gwen and that she's like very into the kingdom and the way that it's run and she has all of these ideas and the king is threatening to give the kingdom to her if the prince doesn't shape up. There is also a play being put on called the prince, the king's idiot son. Um, yes. And so we learned that there are the, the general opinion of the prince in the kingdom is that he is stupid and useless and just um, a screw up. And the king wants him to grow up and get married. And then he yells at a gospel choir. They walk into a room with a gospel choir for reasons. And the king yells at them to be quiet. And when he threatens to give the kingdom to his sister, Princess Gwen, the choir goes, bum, bum, bum. For real. <laughs> I'm not. That wasn't an exaggeration, guys. Um, I liked it. I thought it was silly. I liked this movie so much more when it was being silly and wasn't taking itself too seriously. I thought that was I, the only times it was good. I hated it in a different way when it was being silly. Uh, we then get this weird line. Gwen, uh, the king says, Gwen, stop listening. And she is behind a portrait with the eyes cut out. And she sneaks, you know, peeks around it. Gwen? is blonde with a very dramatic sharp pixie cut look wearing a 1930s women's business suit it's not a pixie cut it's a bob it's a very short bob it's a very short dramatic but it's very 1930s is what i'm going with she's wearing a friny fisher bob the blonde yes okay it's the 30s is what i'm hitting the important point thing here is that it's the 30s um and she goes can i can I share my plan with you for switching from coal power to wind power? And they don't want to hear it. This is the running joke. She's always hiding behind something and she always wants to know if it's a good time to share her plans for the kingdom, how to improve something. And everyone's always like, no, it's not a good time. Don't talk to us about that. Yeah. So the prince, we should describe him. I have him down as boring and dark with a tiny earring. He's just a pretty white boy. He's got dark hair. He's... Let me see who he's played by. He's not even pretty, though. I mean, like, he's not ugly, but he doesn't have any personality or features that are immediately distinctive. If you swapped him out with any other random semi-hot white boy with dark hair, I wouldn't notice. Okay, so he he's an English actor named Nicholas Galadzine? He was so bland. He, he was... He wasn't very interesting, but he was fine. Like, I could probably pick him up. I could probably pick him out of a lineup. I mean, maybe. He had a nice voice. I really resented how much he sang, but at least his voice was okay. So Which brings us... The scene ends with them announcing that there's going to be a ball. Mm -hmm. And that he's going to pick his bride at the ball because he hasn't picked one yet. And the chorus Ooh. sings that the ball is a good idea he also we get this great line where the prince goes i can't just go to a ball and pick a bride what would we do just look at each other until we grow old into our 40s what would we even do which that was pretty funny it was pretty funny but also i didn't understand what it was saying was he implying that people die in their 40s because that's like a 1300s thing yes and no that was the joke he was making okay because that, again, messes up the timeline really bad because people stop dying in their 40s average on, I mean, the average lifespan, it, it screwed up. We can't go there. We can't infant, go there. Infant mortality. But <laughs> I don't know what happened. 
I don't want to. So All what right. happens next is that they sink somebody oh. to love forever. They sing it forever. It spans like seventeen scenes. Oh. So the prince, the prince sings it with the chorus doing backup. And it goes all the way into the changing of the guard with the guards also singing it. Well, so it ends for a second and my notes go, oh good, the change of the guard happens. Oh, they're also singing. So there's a, there's a running joke in, uh, in Gallivant, if anyone's ever seen it, where they explain that she can, the, the, some character can easily escape because during the changing of the guard, because the changing of the guard is ridiculously elaborate. And it's that levels of stupid, but not cute. So the changing of the guard happens and they continue to sing somebody to love along with something else and there's songs mixed over one another and the crowd is there and the king suddenly stops the song to scream to scream get off my dad at which point i thought i'd gone insane what has happened is that cinderella couldn't see because she's short, so she decided to climb into the lap of the statue of the king's father, and she's just there, like, above everybody else. And then she has just the weirdest interaction with the royal family. The weirdest. The weirdest? She's just very comfortable with having the attention on her, which is odd, because she's saying that she's uncomfortable, like, out loud. She's like, oh, everyone's looking at me, great. Like exactly like what that. I wanted. Yeah. But then her reaction is, hey, have you ever considered putting bleachers back here? I could. She's just very suave. She's very bantery. She's very extroverted. But she's saying all these introverted words like, oh, everybody's looking at me exactly what I wanted. Like, that's not. It's... She then pretends to hold the chin of the statue as if she would make it talk like a puppet. But obviously she can't because it's a statue. And so she does this like a silly voice and goes, I hereby decree all short peasants pardoned by the king. And I'm so glad I missed that. I'm so glad I missed that moment. And she kind of laughs and the prince kind of laughs. Like he's into it. He thinks that like all yeah. of this is working for him. Yeah, he's very taken by her. Um, so based off of this interaction, if you can call it that, he agrees to do the whole ball thing, but only if they invite every girl in the village, not just the like wealthy proper ones, but just everyone. And the prince goes, he tries to play a, a power play here and he goes, I mean, what choice do you have? What, what a black market would be on your name if the line was not to continue. I mean, what choice do you even have? At which point Gwen knocks over a big sword just making mm -hmm. a big clattery thing and goes is that is that too subtle is that not not subtle enough and then she tries to sit at the table and the king goes don't even think about it and she goes i'm not even allowed a seat at the table fine and just sort of stomps off and we will get the same running i'm not even going to call it a joke the same running interaction with gwen and guys i'm going to spoil it for you about now is when I started rooting for Gwen to murder everybody and take over and become the queen of a beautiful dystopian young adult fiction novel. I wanted Gwen to get together with Princess Laura. Oh, I wanted so them to much. have like a vampy, like yes, just non-binary evil queen, evil queen, gender, whatever, taking over the countries, ruling, making everything better, just benevolent dictators kind of evil maybe maybe good who knows i wanted that so badly at this point and forever so oh, then we move on to our next scene which is terrible it's terrible uh what happens is the prince dresses up in a costume he's gonna go out in a disguise to find the girl that was sitting on the statue because she's beautiful witty and fearless mm -hmm. and his plan is to just walk the streets until he finds her He's talking to his, what we find out is his best friend. Is it Wilbur or Wilfred? I never got his name. You said Wilbur in the chat, so I'm happy to call him Wilbur. I mean, I can look Let's it up. Let's go on. with Wilbur. We're calling him Wilbur. Not looking it up. Can't be bothered. I'm 90% I'm sure it's Wilbur. 
Wilbur. He's all in purple. He has sort of long hair and a very sort of pale, sort of long, horsey, permanently disgruntled face. He's a very bookish young man. Indeed. Um, and basically the prince assures him that he's going to meet her, he's going to find her, and then, you know, if it turns out that she's got, quote, bats in the old belfry, he's going to, his feelings were incorrect and he's just going to back away slowly. And then they go back and forth with telling each other that you have bats in your belfry. No, you have bats in your belfry. And this all ends with Wilbur announcing, well, I'm your best friend. And the prince pauses for a very long time and Wilbur's like, I am your best friend, right? And the prince is like, yes, of course you are. You're my best friend. Beautiful human. So we, we cut back to Cinderella. She has a 1940s Singer sewing machine in her room, again, baffling me on what time this movie happens in. It's literally a Singer sewing machine. It has the logo on it. It's a Singer. I have one in my house. I have owned three in my lifetime. They're my grandmother's. I have. She's talking to the silkworm or caterpillar. It's whatever. a caterpillar. It's not a silkworm. It's now formed a chrysalis. She says, my stepmother doesn't approve. She would probably stop you from doing whatever it is you're doing, which is beautiful and only a little bit gross. My note just says no more mice in all caps. There's, there's more mice antics. I stopped writing down the mice antics. Just assume that they're making random commentary that has nothing to do with anything that's happening. And by the way, guys, we sort of glossed over this. The CGI is terrible. It's not good. It's terrible. They are trying to be too mouse-like, but not mouse-like enough. It is awful. Quick question before we move on. Talon, did you find these mice antics worse or not worse than the Disney mice antics? Okay, this is terrible. They kind of grew on me. Ugh. I'm I, done. I quit the podcast. I quit the I'm podcast. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just, I have so much affection for the actors playing them. Because I've seen them in like so many like game shows and I just find okay. them like I did like those charming. actors a lot. I was I was putting I was pinning all of my hopes on maybe the bit where these mice turn into humans and are these British comedians will save the entire movie. It did not. It was it also not. bad. It did not. It was bad. Um it was not their fault. It was not their fault. They did their best. <sighs> they did not do their best. There was a lot of really bad duds. There were some lines that just sank like a stone <laughs> everything hurt so cinderella takes a satchel and she sneaks out past the stepsisters and stepmother who are hanging out laundry and the stepsisters are asking why are we doing cinderella work and vivian the stepmother says to show them what you're in for if you don't get married at which to point, an appropriate man to an appropriate man at which point one of them i think it's narcissa first sees a really really hot farm boy across the fence his he's shirt's kind of halfway undone done and his, his his um suspenders are sort of hanging off in like a country core cottage core sexy kind of way and he's shoveling big balefuls of hay he he's very good looking young man and the stepmother is like no no not the farm boy she says no matter how toothsome he might be and Narcissa says, what does that mean? And Malvoli goes, it's how old people say poppin. And then we get another song. This is Material Girl. I hate it. Yeah, it was very jarring. The stepmother sings it. And the sisters keep trying to run to the farm boy and she keeps pulling them back. The farm boy joins them singing it at one point and does a backflip or something. Yes, um, it's very random. It's very jarring. It comes from nowhere. It does not add anything to the plot. We could have skipped this entire song and gotten the point across of you need to marry somebody rich or you'll have to do chores. I know the farm boy is hot. He's still not rich. Moving on. We, we could have cut like a whole scene. It didn't add anything. And so moving on. <laughs> Cinderella is in the town square and she's just holding a dress and her plan is to apparently walk up to a fancy lady and try to just get her to buy a dress. Uh, the fancy lady accuses her of having stolen it from whoever she works for. 
and is basically like i'm gonna go to the guards it's very upsetting uh it's i mean i don't know how she thought this was gonna go the scene sort of is introduced by her looking around at all the stalls which all say somebody and sons somebody and sons somebody and sons there's a line in which uh, a guy there is like oh this girl fancies herself a businessman ha 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 everybody's talking down to her making fun of her telling her you know who do you think she is she then goes into the middle of the square and starts hawking her wares as this is a completely non-stolen dress which yes doesn't inspire much confidence it's a known comedy thing that you can just add uh tension to whatever you're saying by going i went to see my friend who is absolutely still alive i know i went to drive this car which is absolutely mine and not stolen and for which i have a license the title for this trope by the way is suspiciously specific denial thank you i didn't know there was a word for it you're so good at this <laughs> so the prince in his piratey costume shows up and goes sounds like you need to lower your price which was not the best way to start a conversation with her because she reacts badly Indeed. and is like i should be allowed to sell it i made it and i could be a business person if i wanted to us ladies give birth and run households how hard can it be to own a shop and does some exam does some examples of banter oh is it hot enough out there for you just random stuff it's not funny it's not endearing it's just it's a very she seems to be very focused on the idea of having a shop but like on all the surface level kind of trappings of it like and this is where I would hang my dresses and not like I could have my own place and run it the way that I want to and sell my own designs like none and, of that gets introduced here yeah and also the concept of you should lower your price oh yeah oh uh, fair wages for handmade clothes are going to be more expensive than mm, clothes that are made um in mass-produced market like the uh, artists you're paying them for their time because their time is also valuable and they spend a lot of it to make really good stuff so i didn't i am positive they did not even think about that and uh, mm -mm. but i still didn't like it so then the prince offers to buy the dress and she goes you know is this pity i don't i don't want your pity and he goes i want to correct a flawed system which but is he... terrible because he's the prince so if you wanted to correct the flawed system he could do so much more than just buying one dress from one girl that he has a crush on. Like specifically ask, just ask his sister Gwen what to do. But he's also the one, he says the line, oh, but ladies can't own shops. He's, he's actively part of the system. He doesn't want to make a better system. He just thinks she's pretty. Um, and he understands that this is important to her. I, I will give him credit. He figures out very quickly that she's very passionate about this. And he tells her that he'll pay triple what she's asking and that he wants the dress. We also get a moment that comes back later. Um, he says, well, the cost of the brooch alone. And she goes, oh, the brooch. There's a brooch on this dress, I guess. It's not a great dress, by the way, guys. I don't like it. Not a great brooch either. <laughs> no, it's it's like a prom dress. It's got sort of ruched tulle and a single strap. It's, it's meh. She, she says, the brooch is her mother's. I never knew her, but... I think she would rather have had me follow my dreams than to have a brooch, which I like. Mm -hmm. I like random instance in this movie. Just the concept of it's more important to follow your dreams and have a brooch if you have a mother who cares about you or had a mother who cared about you at all. They would care much more about your happiness and your well-being than the continuance of owning whatever item it happens to be. And I, I like that. That's the first time we've really seen that. And I like it a lot. It's just a second. And then we go back to the goddamn town crier rapping about the ball. Yes. So he announces that in two weeks hence, there will be a ball. Which was kind of neat that it's not happening the next day. It's good to know. I was so annoyed um, by the rapper that I missed it completely. <laughs> He's also explaining that the prince is going to use the ball to find a bride. And this sparks another conversation between Cinderella and the prince who's in disguise. And she talks about how she's not interested in going because the whole thing is antiquated and not her thing. And she also mentions a bunch of rumors about the prince, including the fact that he's a mama's boy that still gets spanked on the tush tush. That one comes back. Unfortunately, it does. Yeah. 
but he invites her anyways and he says the ball will be full of rich open-minded people from all over the world that he can introduce her to and so she agrees to Mm -hmm. go because that's a good business opportunity yes and she also says that he's kind of cute once he leaves and she uses the money that he paid for the dress with to buy more fabric and she keeps saying she's dirty but she's not yeah she says she smells like a basement my best friends are mice and he kind of backs away and he's like okay well i'll see you at the ball yeah so she goes we go back to the basement now and she has a blue crayon and she starts i want to be clear guys she's not designing anything on these pieces of paper in front of her she's scribbling like a manic toddler just fist around the crayon just scritch 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 big lines she's not designing a gown she's not drawing the outline of a human wearing a dress she's just a toddler who's been given a crayon and an espresso and we get another (laughs) song um so this is am i wrong and the prince is also singing the song and then also glenn and then also the stepmother so i liked this concept of everybody is having a thing that they are singing about and it's a different thing but the same song still sort of applies to them I thought that was kind of cool I have in my notes now that Gwen is now dressed like a dystopian nightmare dominatrix interesting stepsisters are trying on some extremely bizarre dresses and they're balancing books on their head and the prince is playing an electric guitar with his boy band of bland white dudes again I think I think one of them was Indian if that helps is it the one that never got any screen time or lines yes yes Mm. it's the one Mm. okay Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so uh during the song we see Thomas the weird vegetable seller from before come in nothing happens with this the song continues the queen measures the king's throne and sees that it is indeed taller Cinderella has made a gross, it's not gross, it's just a meh one strap prom dress. It's very floofy tool skirt. It's just, it's very bleh. I didn't like it. I didn't like it either. So we see the two stepsisters in dresses, and the stepmother is overcome with how nice they look. And she says, Oh, one of you might become a princess. And after all the bad things we've had, it would be nice to have something good happen to us. And then Ella walks in in her dress and Melvilia goes, well, it's over. I'm eating a muffin and going to bed. And this is where we find out that um, Cinderella doesn't need to go to the ball. Her stepmother tells her, you know, I'm sorry I didn't support you. That is a beautiful dress, but I should have told you earlier, you're not coming. And Cinderella is like, why? And the stepmother goes, well, it's only for single girls and you're now betrothed you're spoken for and Cinderella's like what do you mean I speak for myself and she's like no no Thomas speaks for you I'm giving you away to him and then she takes ink and spills it on Cinderella's dress and tells her to stay home and find a way to be that man's bride upset me further and you will have no one in this life it's a very upsetting scene But it also doesn't make any sense because the ink that's on Cinderella's dress is admittedly right on her bodice, but it's only in a small spot. She could very easily wrap a large ribbon around it and it would be fixed. The scene in the Disney Cinderella where they destroy the dress that she has made is so heart-wrenching because they rip it to shreds and she's wearing rags at the end of it. Mm -hmm. This is a tulle prom dress with a splotch on the center like she spilled dark raspberry jam on it and it's a large splot but she could very easily just take a sash and go and this dress has a sash now and it'd be fine she wouldn't it's not ever it's not all over her bodice and down her front or it's not torn it's just it's smaller than the size of someone's palm i thought it was pretty bad i thought i it it made me upset it was emotionally distressing as a dress though yeah that dress is sort of it's not a great dress it's definitely sort of screwed up but you could still go to a ball with a sash and be like no 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 this sash is decorative and this is the dress that i designed so you can still see the lines of the dress if that's what she's going for i guess 
So I, I just don't think that that was the barrier that they made it out to be. I mean, um, the, the actual barrier is that the stepmother is going to disown her if she goes to the ball. Yeah, that's the actual barrier, but they don't actually play that up very much. They just play the, the ink on the dress. Not in that scene, no. It, it mostly it comes, comes out later. later. Yeah, yeah. So we go back to the basement. The mice are kvetching. The box that the, that the um, caterpillar is in bursts into a bright light glowing from it and then becomes a butterfly and flies away again with the leathery wing noises Mm -hmm. the mice follow it out into the courtyard cinderella is back in her regular corset 13th century belt and late 1800s skirt and sings there's a reprise of the million to one song yeah and she's just in the barnyard. She's not in the in the courtyard. Sorry, she's in the courtyard. She's not even dancing at this point. She's just gesticulating frantically. And the butterfly lands on her finger. And then the butterfly has a really cool transformation scene. Um, I didn't like it. I thought it was too visceral. It was very visceral, but I kind of liked it. It was very close up, so you were never really sure of exactly what you were seeing, which I liked because it gave the imagination more room. It is very visceral where the the carapace turns to carapace isn't the wrong word Um, you can see the skin of the butterfly's wings like stretching and pulling and changing it's very visceral i I will give you that it Um, was like a werewolf transformation it was it was it was and this transforms into the fabulous godparent so the fabulous godparent says you saved me now i'm here to save you by sending you to the ball can you describe the fabulous godparent? Because um, we have not actually described them. Yeah, the outfit that they're wearing is this big, orange, fabulous, large, high, distant colored thing. It's sort of a waistcoat. Um, not a waistcoat, sorry. It's sort of a, a just a massive coat. It gathers tight around the waist and has this big, large skirt thing. But again, it's a coat. It's not a skirt. And they're just sort of tights under it that are sparkly and shiny and it's very butterfly-esque i really liked the outfit i thought the outfit was phenomenal and they're wearing a sparkly shiny i guess supposed to be diamond or rhinestones collar that extends down the throat it's it's genuinely lovely i enjoyed the outfit a lot especially since it was supposed to be a butterfly yeah i thought the outfit was beautiful i loved the skirt with the pants look and it was very, very sparkly, which is what I want for my fairy godparent. Agreed. Billy Porter as the as the fabulous <laughs> godparent has short cropped hair, has some facial hair, but is like very high femme presenting. Beautiful person of color. Again, some facial hair, very femme presenting, but very strong features. And is just very over the top in their language and tone just a caricature they're very camp very camp maybe caricature is the wrong word but extremely camp just all the way to 11 Mm -hmm. they and they're also very much toying with a fourth wall so we get a lot of let's not ruin this incredibly magical moment with reason it's just it's too meta i don't enjoy it that's when she says, quite frankly, I think you're a figment of my imagination. Yeah. Let's not ruin this magical moment with reason. It's just, it was too, they were too much aware of them being in a fairy tale. It was weird. Uh, and then they start singing a song as well, because there hasn't been a song in four minutes. So this is Shining Star, which yeah. I never liked as a song. <laughs> yeah they end with sort of a very head boppy side to side movement which cinderella uh, imitates and the whole song just grinds to a halt and they say well you can't go in that and she goes yeah i know and so they flash their wand and transform what she's wearing into a pale blue business suit which she responds to with oh wow i've never seen anything like this And they go, fine, I thought you wanted to be a businesswoman, which, okay, it was sort of a cute moment, but also I didn't like it because Cinderella was not 
mad about this outfit she was just had never seen anything like it before and was just taken aback Mm -hmm. and the fact that the fairy godparent knew that this was what a businesswoman wears was just a weird time traveling meta thing and i didn't i didn't like it so fairy godparent then waves their wand again and some sparkles go but nothing happens and cinderella goes what happened and fairy godparent goes wait for it and i hated it i hated it so much uh, yeah so what happens is one of her dress designs the very sparkliest floofiest one flies off her wall of dress designs and that's the dress that she ends up wearing she goes no not that one that design is pure fantasy I don't even know if it's possible and the fairy godparent goes hush it's magic time and all these flower petals flow down and swirl around her and she kind of shrieks and they form her dress and she's like it's beautiful it's a beautiful dress it's uh, kind of a floofy prom dress it has a tight sparkly bodice and a very distinct tulle skirt the skirt is very 1700s in the sense that it is very rectangular and wide rather than being circular it also has these incredibly weird pleats that go pleats are supposed to go sort of vertically with the body these pleats go on an x-axis out away from the body so there are these pleats that extend outward from the body sort of like a tutu but then it's not a tutu because it extends into a full skirt it was very extremely bizarre and she's got uh, see-through half sleeves or something it's pretty and it looks good on her and it's sort of mm, white pink colored i guess i couldn't really tell but it's an extremely weird dress it's not ugly but it's weird it's distinctive yeah let's call it distinctive uh so the fairy godparent goes yes future queen yes with like an a which i'm kind of over so this whole thing reminded me very much of the uh cinderella 2 the disney sequel that we hated Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that one was so modern when it was made it was clearly trying so hard to be hip and with it and now and it aged so quickly yeah I but this felt identical this felt identical to me I have a lot of questions about their decision to have like really strict gender roles and have a gender non-conforming carry godparent and not engage with that whatsoever whatsoever there will also be the pretty broad insinuation of a gay couple which will never get actually addressed or referenced so if you're gonna have a gender non-binary fairy godparent which i'm all in favor of lean into it i just thought it would be very cool if the fairy godparent had been like you can live your own truth you don't have to fit into whatever box people put you in like anything like that any kind of like yeah. pat line i would have i would have eaten it up i would have been like yes thank you that's what i wanted but we don't get any of that and also while we're at it I don't love the way that they approach the multicultural like the blind casting in this because the prince and the king and the queen are all white and most of the people of color are just the villagers and the servants and it doesn't have the same like inclusive happy vibe that the brandy cinderella did It just doesn't. It doesn't because the characters who are of color tend are either a servants, as you said, or they are cast in very. They're like, oh, this is a black character. They're going to be the ones that rap. Or this is a very over the top black non-binary person. They're going to be very over the top in a very stereotypically black kind of way, not necessarily in an offensive way way i don't know i'm not a person of color but it's just it wasn't there was attention called to it in a way that there was no attention called to it whatsoever in the brandy cinderella and i'm not saying that the brandy cinderella is like the blueprint for what every movie has to do no i'm just saying i liked it a lot better and it seemed a lot more seamless and i kept coming up across these like little jagged edges in this where it just felt like 
Like there was a lot of performers who were black, but there wasn't a lot of characters who were part of the story who were black. Yeah, like in in the Brain of Cinderella, one of the stepsisters black, Whoopi Goldberg, the the fairy godmother, uh, Whitney Houston, um, Brandy, and Brandy, <laughs> and the prince is uh, Asian. There were, I, I didn't see any people of, who were potentially Asian in this, so it was very yeah i just it felt like they were really trying to be inclusive but they it felt like they didn't really think about it that much or they or they overthought it and they were like well everyone's parent has to like look like the same as their child child otherwise that wouldn't make sense and that's what we loved about the brandy cinderella we're like yeah sure one of the stepsisters is black i don't care so the fabulous godparents makes the glass shoes and Cinderella goes, is there any way you can make them more comfortable? And the fairy godparent goes, women's shoes are as they are. Magic can only do so much. And then she walks awkwardly in them for a couple of steps. And then they magic her sort of over their shoulder. And suddenly she can walk in them again. Why did we have that scene then? It was, it was a dumb nothing scene anyway. Um, and then she asks, I don't suppose you could actually get me to the ball, could you? And so there's a box of some kind that gets transformed into a carriage with horses. And then the fairy godparent notices the mice who mm-hmm. squeak, holy fudge, and calls them disgusting little creatures and turns them into footmen who are played by the actors who have been voicing the mice one of them falls over because he doesn't have a tail and he can't balance and that was the first moment that i smiled uh cinderella is surprised that they're all boys she had assumed that they were girls and when asked why why he says well mice are girls and rats are boys (laughs) at which point the mice (laughs) ask didn't you ever think how rats make more rats and they all just pause for a second and the fairy godparent goes moving on and it was just, it was such a weird beat to include in this movie about gender roles and stereotyping. It uh, was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard, but I loved it. It was just, it was just a moment of pure stupidity on the part of Cinderella. <laughs> and it was like the most charming thing she had done up to that point. So the fabulous godparent charges the mice with the duty of getting her to the palace and I do like that they lead into the fact that the mice do not know how to get to the palace and do not know how to do this I like that yes because they've never been outside the courtyard yeah so they continue to sing they're all doing the sort of head side to side boppy thing um the mice are confused about the rains and the song ends but one of the mice keeps on singing at which point Cinderella has a panic attack because uh, her stepmother will be there. And if her stepmother sees her, she will throw her out. She will throw her out onto the street. She won't have anywhere to go. And the fabulous godparent goes, as long as you're wearing the dress, no one will recognize you. And Cinderella goes, wait, that actually doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm expecting somebody there. I need to meet somebody who's going to introduce me to, you know, fancy clients. people. Yeah. To At time. which point yeah. the fairy godparent goes, well, aren't you high maintenance? No. No, that's not what high maintenance means. It's that's fine. Not- it's fine. I wasn't mad about that. I thought that was playful and teasing. Okay, anyway, so that. the rules are thus. No one's going to recognize her. The prince will recognize her. He's <laughs> and, the exception. And she's told that when it gets to midnight, she has to run. Yeah, with the line, when the magic wears off, wait, what? That can happen? When the clock strikes 12 run that's not a helpful instruction and it implies there's going to be something like werewolves like it could be if someone tells me run i assume that there is either a, a wolf chasing me or a serial killer chasing me run yeah i don't run is not the command given for you need to extricate yourself from the situation so that was weird and very uh, jarring for me. So um, after that, we cut to the ball. And I hate it. I hate the lighting. There's candles all around the edge, big, lots of big candelabra. And it's clearly intended to be mood lighting. But everybody is spotlit. Mm-hmm. 
And I hated that contrast. Just you have all these beautiful candles around. You're not even going to go through the effort of making everything look soft lit. You're just going to do spotlights in the middle of the room as though that's the light candles cast when you clearly have candles around the edges casting not that light. I don't know why I focused in on that so hard. But it really upset me. I'm sorry. So the king and the queen are in this boxy balcony overlooking everything. And the princess Gwen is behind them. And the queen is kind of like, are we really going to stay up here this whole time? We're not going to dance at all. And the king goes, it's not about you and me. It's about keeping an eye on our son. We find out that the queen loves dancing and she's sad about this. Yes. Um, Gwen cuts in with, would this be a good time to tell you about my comprehensive plan to reduce poverty in row houses? No, read the room. Yeah. And then the prince gets introduced and the crowd on the dance floor kind of thins out and it's all these princesses that are dressed like they're from different cultures and all of their dresses are very different from each other. And I really kind of was expecting to like that. Yeah, they, and I did like that. I did like that their dresses were so different and that they were very clearly from different cultures because Slipper and the Rose tried to do that and they wound up with a bunch of white princesses wearing exactly the same thing with occasional weird headdresses. And this had several black princesses, several princesses wearing uh, very different types of things and with different accents. And there was a princess who had a shaved head, which I thought was really wonderful to include. Yeah, um, it was really cool. Except... But what, what immediately they do, happens <laughs> what they <sighs> do is they all strike a pose because they're introduced to the prince and it goes you're prince and they all strike a pose and then they sing what a man at him yeah. also it's a rap we we thought for a moment that we were going to get a princesses on parade song where they introduce you know themselves yeah. but no no they just talk about what they've heard about him or what they like about him. And uh, this rap section ends with the stepsisters rolling in going, I want to have your baby, which I think we've now have a new worst opening line to the prince. <laughs> <laughs> the prince is kind of scared by all of these women kind of singing aggressively at him. Right. So. There's this thrumming bass line. And then Seven Nation Army starts playing and he we sings that. We get an intense cello solo, like an intense two cellos. It's only one cello, but it's a cello solo and it's dramatic and it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they sing What a Man at Him again. And then the cello soloist ends with another cello solo. And then she dramatically breaks the cello and then everyone kind of gasps and then she gets up and gets another one. Like and in a very rock star breaking a guitar kind of way, not accidentally. Yeah, and then she continues to play very proper classical music. They do a weird circle dance. Um, there, there's a type of dance where you have a partner and you go and the, the, the men go into the circle and the women dance outside them and then they return in. So the prince and his three stooges are doing this, but there's the four of them in the center of the circle and 12 or 15 princesses around them. So it just feels very weird and huntery. And they're singing these songs on top of one another. So it, it's a dramatic scene and it's musically interesting, I guess. But I was really annoyed that we didn't get a Princesses on Parade song. Mm -hmm. And then everyone pretends that that scene didn't happen and they move on. Yeah. Just like a normal ball, like that didn't just happen. So at this point, Cinderella enters the ball, and we don't get a moment where everyone stares at her. Instead, she bumps into her stepmother, who doesn't recognize her and apologizes very effusively because she thinks that she's a royal. Mm -hmm. um, and Cinderella sort of extricates herself from it and is like, ah, yes, um, do not worry about it. And we're all equal here tonight. Goodbye. And so it's like very stiltedly. And one important thing that happens is that the stepmother notes the shoes and is very impressed by them. Yeah, I, I did like that it was at least addressed why the stepmother doesn't recognize her. Yes. It was but really also, clumsily done. But, but also, I wish they'd found a different way to do it. I wish it had been a masquerade or something like that, or that she had done her hair up so differently that, like, she just looked different enough that she didn't think she would get caught. 
or maybe if she'd actually had a dirty face the whole time and now it was suddenly clean and done up in like really intense makeup with contours and eyeshadow and stuff where they do the whole you know before and after face videos there were a lot of ways this could go but there were options i thought it was a little heavy-handed we then have a scene where the mice joke about peeing through the front tail they're now in human form and they're just like enjoying the bounty of delights that being a human shaped person brings and they have front tails and that's how they relieve themselves and they're very excited about that i'd like to point out that my, you know what we'll save it we'll save it if you guys want to hear us talk about this a whole bunch you should come to the ever after party you should find us at patreon.com slash <laughs> I don't know if this is the way to sell it. I don't think it is. <laughs> whatever. Anyways, so now we meet we meet Queen Tatiana now. Yes. Who is my favorite character in the entire movie. I loved her. So Queen Tatiana is this very regal black older woman. She has um, sort of a Caribbean accent. Yes. And when she's approached by Cinderella she's called your highness and she goes your highness was the man I killed to take the crown I loved it it was so good my name is Tatiana you can call me queen Tatiana (laughs) just emphasize the queen and she's wearing this beautiful golden headdress with elaborate curls and this gorgeous dress she is fabulous I love her she's so powerful she's so strong She's so friendly, except we just got told that she murdered somebody, which I loved. So she compliments Cinderella's dress, and then Cinderella just babbles at her um, because she asks her where she got the dress. And Cinderella's like, me did. It's what I done. I hope I did. I want me, to do I, me. Did. I did. Genuinely uh, that, but for a solid minute, it was the weirdest, awkwardest. When you want to do somebody awkwardly asking a answering a question that they weren't prepared for it doesn't go on for this long that's not you can rapidly formulate your thoughts and go i me i i designed this dress you can collect your thoughts quicker than 60 seconds it takes her much longer so So while this scene is happening the prince is on the ballroom dance floor announcing and they're like kind of in an alcove so they're not really hearing what the prince is saying they're in a balcony of some kind yeah so the prince announces to the other girls there that he is interested in someone but that someone is not there and that he's sorry but he can't be with any of them and then he starts to describe cinderella and like kind of tell them what their conversation was and we switch back to cinderella's conversation with queen tatiana who is very into the dress that cinderella's made and has a lot of engagements that she goes to and she hates all of her clothes and she's looking for someone to travel with her all around the world and dress her fabulously and is cinderella interested and oh boy is cinderella interested absolutely so they make a plan to meet the following day at four o'clock in the village center basically Mm -hmm. um and at this point she notices that the prince is talking to everybody and I guess this is where she figures out that that's the guy that she met. Mm-hmm. But we don't really get a lot of emphasis on that. And then she crashes into a symbol and everyone looks at her. She walks onto the band on stage and just walks into a pair of symbols. Which, I just want to be clear, if you're trying to sneak through somebody, through the band is not the way to go. No, it was a no. bad call. So the prince turns around and see her, sees her and she is trying to sort of sneak away like that didn't happen, that didn't happen, nobody can see me, they said no one could see me, which is not what they said. Um, and the prince goes, oh, you look so different. And she goes, you look so different. You know, why were you in disguise? And why, I'm going to go. And, you know, I, I've seen all the dresses, I've had the bubbly drinks, I've talked to my rich potential clients, I'm going to go while I'm still ahead. And the prince goes, you haven't seen all the dresses and he walks her to the floor he also winks at her yeah and then he acknowledges the people's princess gwen and gwen stands up from behind her parents and she's been wearing this big purple cloak and she undoes her cloak and lets it fall and she's wearing ella's dress 
and that it's was very cute it was cute we like that it doesn't make any sense that it would fit her because clothes are made for specific people it's also very much not her style at all because we oh. see her in a lot of very structured high collared things and this is an off the shoulder gauzy thing yeah not her style at all also not her color Gwen is pale and blonde and this is sort of a beigey pink color so it doesn't look good on her so that was a weird choice given that the movie people knew this was going to happen so Cinderella goes oh if you could make the room stop spinning please that would be great and the prince goes well would you like to dance with me and my notes go into all caps at this point well they sing perfect by Ed Sheeran to each other sure and I hate it <laughs> so they they dim the candles the lights dim which is not how candles work but the spotlights come on them extra which is again not how candles work they start to sing whatever that song is to each other I'm not really into my pop culture so whatever it is they're singing they sing and I don't like the song they then do something that is clearly meant to be a dip but what happens is that Cinderella just free falls backwards the prince is standing in front of her and he just leans forward and catches her before she hits the ground that's not how you dip that is not safe it's not elegant it's not pretty and it's not safe for either party i hated it they're both just standing there doing like body rolls like full torso undulations towards one another the candles yes, they are mm -hmm. are just flickering in the background and the camera is spinning around them to make it look like they're dancing but they're not dancing he does this weird lift but that's it it's again it's not a dance it was the worst unromantic dance i've ever seen of all of them and then it ends on this really weird emotional beat because they sing part of the song to each other and she says very like sadly and sincerely well she sings very sadly and sincerely I don't deserve this and he sings back at her darling you look perfect and it's like a very intense emotional moment that doesn't fit the banter that they had before or the banter that they have after and it's just like a weird it was just a weird beat yeah they really push this love it for just deeply in love thing but none of their actual interactions that are bantery feel even remotely like love so the prince asks if she would like to talk alone somewhere and she goes yes and follows him and then from this moment on every scene with them talking to each other is interspersed with the men who used to be mice just discovering things about being human so like clapping like clapping like they're clapping hands and they're like enjoying that and then we go back to them having this romantic interlude and then we go back to the mice who are like talking to the horse and trying to see what it was like being a box and then we go back to them having a romantic moment yeah it was the weirdest choice i've ever seen yeah tips for romantic moments don't intersperse it with terrible mouse comedy it was bad it yeah. was a bad call so he leads her the prince leads cinderella into a piano room and she goes i should probably take my shoes off and he goes you don't need to this floor is literally two thousand years old I assumed that there was going to be something relevant that happened like she slipped and had to take her shoes off or I assumed there was going to be something because that line seemed like a line that meant something nope doesn't mean anything and so there's a piano and Cinderella's sort of sassy like oh are you going to like sit down and play something on the piano for me and then he sits down and starts to play the piano and she goes oh my god you are and at which point <laughs> our chat Talon goes if he starts to sing I'm leaving <laughs> I was like, no, I you meant can't. it. I meant it. I was like, ready to get up. I was, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to sit through it again. I was like, I, no, you can't leave. I forbid it. Fortunately, they don't sing. She yet. compliments him yet. We thought that we had gotten through this scene. We won't, but at the moment he doesn't sing. He just plays a few notes. She compliments him and he teases her about the, the mean stuff that she had said to him in the market square. And then he criticizes the monarchy and how it makes no sense because his only qualification is that his father was a king and how his life is too much about tradition and customs and never asking what he wants and they sort of commiserate on this it's very much an ever after you've been born to privilege and with that comes specific obligation scene but terribly done i want to point out dear listener um 
at this point, my notes go, only 30 minutes left. Thank God. Mm-hmm. That was the first time that I thought there were only 30 minutes left. It was not the last. Just so that you could experience my experience. It was not a good experience. It was terrible. <laughs> and so then, they're sort of sitting on this piano bench, very, it's sort of, it's very romantic. And he goes, I've chosen you. I pick, I pick you to be my princess. And she goes, what? And he goes, and I don't mind that you're not royal. And she's like, what? What about my business? And he goes, well, that'd probably be pretty frowned upon. But I'll, I'll make sure that you're dressed in the finest fashion by the dressmakers in all the land. And she goes, I, I am a dressmaker. And he goes, well, he, he sort of blathers for a bit. And she goes, I don't want a life confined to a royal box any more than a basement. So if it's a choice, I choose me. Which I liked. I liked that concept that being confined does not matter whether it is a golden cage or an iron prison being confined is still being confined and that it is better to choose oneself and what's best for you so i i like the sentiment i hated how that this is how they chose to do it but i liked that moment i thought that this happened in the wrong place in the story I think they should have had a beautiful time and then she should have run away like Cinderella usually does and then he should have found her and then he should have been like I pick you I want you to be my princess and then they should have had that conversation yes that would have fixed this that would have made this really hit home and be much better so he sadly says that he understands and my notes go she leaves dot 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 nope nope he starts to sing we almost got through it without a song it's it's very short she sings along it's the song that they dance to together he plays it on the piano and sings and she's like crying and singing along and she runs into his arms and they hug and they're about to kiss and then the bell starts ringing midnight and she runs away yeah and the mice are freaking out uh because they feel weird just you just cleaned phantom whiskers no i didn't and cinderella's running through the ballroom and Queen Tatiana stops her and says, I haven't lost you to the prince. You're still going to meet me. And she promises that she'll still meet Queen Tatiana. And then the king announces that she's the future queen. And the ki- the prince is there and she begs him for help to do something? To escape. Because How? everyone starts crowding around her. Okay. Okay. So he does help her escape, which I like. That was yes. a good prince moment. Good yes. for you, princey. So he escort. He clears. He helps her through the room, and he basically are, goes, "You go. I'll take care of this." Basically, it's very nice. I appreciated his just whatever she said she needed. He basically just agreed to without question mm-hmm. when it was an immediacy thing, which I really appreciated and liked. So the mice are now freaking out. What was what was the what did they say? What did they say about the magic? I don't know because I was thinking. Well, why weren't you listening? Because I was singing. The magic of being able to wear the shoes comfortably wears off, so she throws the shoe at Wilbur, the prince's friend, who's and trying races, to follow her, and races after the carriage. We're now in um a a drama. We're now in a crime drama escape antics movie by the way y'all we've left the fairy tale realm cinderella is sprinting after her carriage the mice are screaming to her as they hold out their hands from the carriage as she frantically tries to reach their hands and they haul her bodily into the carriage the mice Um, are still men at this point but now they start to transform back into mice and one of them pops into a mouse but his head is still human for a while that was the worst thing that has ever happened to me and he screams don't look at me don't look at me (laughs) and he and cinderella yeah i wish i'd followed that direction yeah he and cinderella just scream face to face at one another for a long time um cinderella races to the front and takes the reins but starts to not matter because the horses turn back into whatever metal things they had been come from sort of a metal symbol that was on uh whatever and they're all sort of waiting in this carriage as it rolls to a halt and they're all sort of flinched and cringed waiting for the for the shoe to drop and then they all release their breath and then they fall because the carriage turned us back into crates it was a very obvious beat so it wasn't really funny i enjoyed it it was fine 
it was okay but whatever uh the shoe stays a shoe why we just had such a dramatic experience because the shoe is always exempt for some reason you just got to go with it it's well, part of the cinderella story we, we just established that we're not watching a cinderella anymore this this isn't a cinderella i don't know what this is it has a lot of beats of a cinderella but this is 100 percent not a cinderella it's the weirdest not quite a cinderella that we've seen i might have to make a fifth category which is like evil doppelganger so we cut to the um the palace the king is furious because all the peasants tax dollars were wasted and he's and been embarrassed because the prince isn't marrying somebody and he's single-handedly destroying the king's legacy uh the prince explains that the girl he picked didn't choose him mm-hmm. and the king doesn't take that information well and he goes have you lost your mind you're the future king there are no other opinions none This is where Gwen interjects with, is this a good time to ask why we're spending so much money on catapults? And she's told, no, this is not a good time to ask. Yeah. Uh, The king demands that he marries Princess Laura from the beginning. And the prince has a very sad uh, face and goes, if the crown demands it, with sort of sad eyes. And his mother, the queen, attempts to offer sympathy and he leaves and the queen then rounds and uh, turns on the king and goes did you really say they don't care if they love each other and the king goes well yeah obviously and the queen is very mad and storms mm-hmm. off now we cut back to the mice talking about the ball i think i hated the mice in this much in this one as much as you hated the mice in the disney one just every second I, with the mice i really hated the mice 90% of the time and then 10% of the time I was like reluctantly charmed I was okay with the mice when they were humans some of the time I like the mice later I'll, I'll tell you when we get there I assume I hate the mice unless they say otherwise it's fair so Cinderella was making dresses and the mice were squeaking and she goes you know I can hear you you're probably wondering why I didn't marry the prince since I'm maybe probably in love with him and the mice are like you put you're in love with him you were only there for a couple like you were only there for a little bit at which point we find out that she doesn't actually hear them she's only hearing squeaks but they can understand her and talk to her Mm -hmm. they Um, do agree that the prince is very handsome though yes that's important i guess (laughs) so so she reiterates that queen tatiana is her her chance and that this is what her future is and then her stepmother starts calling for her so she kind of hides everything all around the basement so that she's not caught as having been to the ball and she climbs into bed and she tells her that she's sick specifically the shoe she hides the shoe specifically there's big mountains of fabric on the table but the shoe is hidden yes and the stepmother says well you didn't miss much at the ball the prince was fixated on some mystery girl she ran away like a twit and now he has to marry princess princess laura and she talks about how she kind of got carried away and that her daughters never really stood a chance and she says i know i've been hard on you but it's not fueled by spite i've never shared this with anyone before but i used to play the piano i taught myself and i was good i was really good nothing made me happier and she basically tells her the story about how one day she was given the opportunity to train at the finest school of music and she had two children and a husband, and she had the audacity to want more. So she went there for just a month. And then when she returned, her husband, um, it, it gets like very vague, but basically her husband didn't believe that real wives would act so frivolously. So it sounds like he didn't die that they got a divorce or yeah. whatever equivalent of that in and this made up time period. And she's playing this very dramatically. She's choking back tears at this point. Yes. This um, is her, this is her like character defining moment. Yeah. Bear in mind, we're almost done with the movie. We've waited until now to introduce anything human about her. And she goes, You may think me cruel, but the real cruelty would be for me to allow you to think you can be something you can't. And mm-hmm. at that point, one of the mice knocks over the slipper and the stepmother picks it up, realizes it was her, and she says, I don't know what you did but 
you have to go marry the prince and she keeps trying to encourage her to do it like do it for us do it for the family and if she's not going to do it then she's going to take him take her, cinderella to thomas and is giving her to him today and cinderella goes i'd rather die and then we get another song yes this is the world doesn't need another dream girl does this song have a name uh it's just dream girl okay and i believe it's an original song for this movie okay this y'all this is an anti-girl power anthem sung by girls the clips that we get of people singing this are the servant the female servants in the palace the stepmother cinderella gwen the queen women in the village um and it's the world isn't another dream girl bury your dreams carry them to the grave marry it to get out of it you're too dumb you're too young it's a very dramatic sort of girl power song but again it is an anti-girl power song it includes the line uh, some legends were born in the wrong time uh the stepmother is playing the piano dramatically a beautiful piece that she plays by the way it's lovely i don't know what it is it's beautiful why don't we introduce this earlier why don't we have a reference to a piano earlier why don't we have the stepmother playing a piano earlier or having an emotional reaction to someone playing the piano earlier why don't we introduce this earlier because i'm not i'm not mad that she has human characteristics but i'm furious that we don't get it until this late in the movie and it's just shoehorned in there Mm -hmm. it's really frustrating it really disrupts the flow of the movie it really disrupts the characterization that has already been cemented Mm -hmm. where she is cruel and capricious and like now it just doesn't work for me yeah now all of a sudden they're like oh you're supposed to care about her they're they're trying to do the ever after thing where angelica houston has this moment of did you love my father why i never knew him it it, which is a heart-rending moment and never after and so they're like oh well we'll just do that (laughs) but uh they screwed it up well and ever after it was much more subtle and here they were like oh this exact situation has happened to her before and this is how she paid for it and this is why she thinks that marriage is the only way and yeah yeah it it was was all very contrived it's extremely clumsy is what it was we cut to two people fencing at the palace and uh pierce brosnan the king walks up and says leave us and one of the fencers walks away and the other fencer who we sort of think is going to be the prince winds up being the queen mm-hmm. fencing i thought that was a cute moment it was a cute moment it didn't make any sense with this like world that they've created no but, not at all but sure fine and he's very fussy uh and he goes you haven't talked to me since last night is it because i yelled because sometimes king yells you're, you're making me very uncomfortable and she goes the reason that our son is making this marriage process harder than it has to be is because of our example before you were king i used to feel your love every day you used to serenade me every night with your skull splitting voice and then they sort of fight about who has it harder the person who has to be king or whether it's harder to be queen and stay silent all the time and just be his shadow and never be allowed to do anything and the queen goes it's so hard to be silenced forever and the king goes b because her name is beatrice you're being unreasonable. Mm. Mm. Anybody out there who's dating a woman, just don't use the word unreasonable. Just excise that word from your vocabulary forever. You don't, uh, along with emotional, don't, don't use either of those words. They will not serve you. The queen goes, well, if you say so, I guess there can't be any other opinions. And sort of starts to turn off and goes, you know, we used to have love and at this point i stopped recording what was said and just go i want the queen and gwen to murder everyone and take over the kingdom <laughs> i the queen is like mini driver is very compelling in this role and i completely believe her but tragic she's tragic yeah so Genuinely. it was a very moving scene is what i'm saying it was moving in a hopeless kind of way because the king makes no progress in the scene we do see it later eventually but even then it's sort of a i've arrived at this decision on my own because i am a man and i will not be swayed by a woman i just happen to agree with everything she says but it's not because of her it was everything does wind up at the right answer but 
not in a way that's satisfying. <sighs> mm. I don't know. I didn't like it. So we get the brief scene where the stepmother is Thomas is at the door and the stepmother is giving the Cinderella to him, I guess. Uh, it's a very brief scene with no words. And then we immediately cut back to uh, the king has summoned the prince and the prince Robert goes on this big tirade of, you're so weird. Why can't we just talk like father and son? You never admit you're wrong. You're always pompous in the king and just la, using la, 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 your king voice. La, 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 la. And then the king, he finally stops and the king goes, I was wrong. And brings out the shoe and says, go find the owner am i doing the king's voice like yeah but you can't help it it's okay go find the owner of the slipper if she'll take you back marry her or don't whatever it's your life son and this is the part that irritated me prince goes why the sudden change of heart and the king goes well it definitely wasn't your mom i thought that was funny because it obviously is his mom and like he's not admitting it but he's de- he's also admitting it i mean it's played as cute it is kind of cute but given how I just given how much she's had to be silent and given how shabbily he has treated her and given his response to her set down stuff like oh you're mad at me because I yelled no I'm mad at you because you told me that my opinions don't matter and I don't matter and it doesn't matter that nothing about me matters it's not because you yelled you moron the fact that his his that he still seems very oblivious to the fact that the wrongness lies in the erasure of her as a person mm-hmm. rather than the volume at which he spoke to her mm-hmm. but he is still does, has not made that connection at least on screen to us oh i don't think he's in the right or anything i just i guess i didn't read into it that much it was kind of a cute moment but i thought about it too much and so it stopped being cute that's fair so we get the village crier again, the town crier. Yeah, we got another hear ye kind of song. It's another and essentially, oh, yeah. And essentially the prince is knocking down doors and he's going to all these different houses. And we don't see anybody try on a shoe. He's just knocking on different doors and looking at the girls and being like, no, that's not her. So the town crier announces that he's going to try on the shoes. A lot of them, as the villagers sing back to them songs about is this the shoe? Like, no, that's an old boot. Is is this the shoe? No, your shoes are massive. I wish it was the shoe, but I only had sons and somebody but he sings a really crazy song riff and he's like, that's a great song riff. And the king goes on this montage of beating down doors rhythmically to see her. He doesn't try on the shoe, he just looks at them and goes, that's not her. Someone throws up. This is a, the second vomiting joke we've had. I'm going to have to start keeping track. Oh, God. I don't want this to be a pattern. I didn't, I didn't do this. This isn't my fault. Um, here's what I don't understand. No one tries on the shoe. He just looks at them and is like, yeah, no, that's not her. Why is there a shoe then? Why are we even there bothering? There shouldn't have been a shoe. There shouldn't have been a shoe. It has he nothing just, to do with anything. He just goes around and is like, do I see that person? The shoe is irrelevant. It's, it's clear that the shoe is not individuated to her in any specific way. Like she has incredibly small feet or anything. Um, yeah they don't they don't talk about the shoe at all actually they don't talk about like the artistry or the size or or anything literally nothing it's just there's a shoe she threw it at somebody's head one girl does say not interested which i did like that part made me funny the prince responds with well neither am i they're all wearing sort of uh pleated pirate leather jerkins now the prince and his buddies yeah who are Which... along on this trip for some reason so then we get this brief scene where okay so the prince has three friends one of them is wilbur who he's he's the bookish best friend mm-hmm. um one of them has like long shaggy hair and that's hench and he threw an apple at him earlier mm-hmm. and there's a third best friend who's silent and we never learn anything about him and he looks like he might be East Asian. Yep. And that's it. That's all I got for him. But basically, they're talking about how hopeless it is 
we're not going to find her. This isn't going to work. And Hench is like, this is the only thing that matters. You know, if you don't have someone you love, you might as well just take a dirt nap. And the scene goes on for like a little longer than that. And Hench is just teary eyes. His eyes are just shining with tears. And we cut to Wilbur riding near him, also looking very tragic. And I don't know what that was supposed to imply, but my shipper heart was like, are they in love? I think they're in love. Is it that? Are they not allowed to be in love? I I think they're in love because they show up in the uh, end dance. Guys, just no spoiler. There's another song and dance routine that ends the movie. I I, I didn't want to spoil it for you. Um, But there's another song. And uh, the two of them show up wearing, they've been wearing very somber colors up until now, blacks and dark colors. And they're wearing just very bright, chaotic brocades. And they are near one another. I don't know that that's enough. I think they're this gay. Is, I don't know that this is enough to sustain this like tragic romance that we've built up. The point is, this movie wasn't very interesting. And we kept inventing more interesting movies to watch. Yep. Um, so, and that yeah. would have been one of them. That would have been one of them. So uh, Queen Tatiana walks into the square sort of 15 minutes until the appointed meeting time. Uh, we keep cutting between her and Cinderella in the carriage with a stepmother and Thomas, just very creepy. Cinderella starts to sing the one in a million song again. And then the, the mice. mice. <laughs> and then the you, mice like attack. Yeah. Um, and they distract the driver long enough for Cinderella to jump out of the carriage and roll down a hill and run away and this is when I felt like a surge of affection for the mice because I was like oh that's really nice they're gonna save the day for her except that one of them goes remember me as a hero which implies that he knows that he's going to die which means they killed a mouse no they didn't because all three of the mice show up at the very end and when everybody's dancing they're dancing on like an upturned bucket I can't tell if I like that more or less. <laughs> um, the mice are okay, everyone. Don't worry about the mice. So Again, Cinderella... I can't tell if that's better or worse. <laughs> I don't know what I want to have happen to these mice because there's this horrific CGI 3D mice and I just want them to stop existing. They stop existing when the movie ends. Let's just put it that way. I think this might have been the second or third time I wrote half an hour left. <laughs> oh my god i kept being there like a- there's half an hour left and Talon was like you said that 10 minutes ago and it's still not true it's like the 10 minutes ago i met you song <laughs> but it's half an hour to go <laughs> and we play it on repeat oh god that's terrible okay so cinderella is running into the city and the prince is riding into the city and they're both singing the million to one song, but they're like right. actually five feet apart for most of it. Yeah. And then they kind of sort of bump into each other almost. The prince chases her down. He overtakes her on his horse, at which point she is aware of him and she shrieks and falls over like you do when you're running through a field and all of a sudden there's a horseman with your true love on it running past you very at, dramatic at which point they stop and have an extremely boring conversation of like oh hey hi i didn't expect to see you here and it comes out of nowhere and he's basically like hey you are right and she goes oh hey it's you what's up like it, it's very casual the amount of times that this movie just like stops dead and decides that it's not going to do a movie anymore is insane so uh, he starts saying, oh, you inspired me. Again, this is very much a ever after of, you taught me that I could have passion about things and choose my own, but it's, they're trying to do ever after and they failed. And she's like, yeah, could like I'm in a hurry. I need to be somewhere. And he's like, but I choose me, which is what she said previously. And he, she's like, what? I don't, also, I'm still in a hurry. I kind of have somewhere to go. And he's like, no, I have these thoughts. And she's like, oh, this is gonna be a long conversation. Okay. And he goes, I don't want to be king anymore and I want you more than I want to be king so by choosing me I'm choosing us as long as that's still what you want which I did like the inclusion of that line that was a nice Mm -hmm. line to include and she sort of pauses and he goes okay your silence is getting kind of and then she you know grabs him and kisses him and they have a good kiss it's a nice kiss 
It was very sweet. It was very. But then they ruin it by talking about how romantic the moment just was. She's like, you rode up on a horse. And he's like, yeah, it was very cool, wasn't it? And she's like, yeah, and you're so handsome. And he's like, you look so beautiful. And they're just like having banter at each other. But they're was- also like reminding us that it's a tense moment and that she's got to go. Yeah, she's like, oh, I got to go put me on the horse and take me to the village square. And he picks her up to carry her for three steps. And she's like, actually, just put me down. It'll be faster if I walk. And he's like, yeah, no. And she's like, no, but that was a cute thing. That was cute. The whole thing, just this movie just takes us in and out and in and out of it so much. They can never sustain a dramatic moment. And they can never sustain any, like, real chemistry between the prince and Cinderella. None. Other than just sort of flirty banter that you would get as a precursor to romance. Yes, they not as very like, good precursor romance. Yeah, not as like a I'm ready to give up a kingdom for you kind very of romantic act, gesture. They had very, very consistent act one banter between two yeah. love interests. Yeah. So we cut back to the palace and the queen is painting and she hears the king shouting for her outside. And she puts down her paintbrush annoyedly and strides to the window going, what fresh hell is this? Which I think it was the one use of the word hell in this entire movie because it's a PG movie and it was like perfect. It was so great. It was wonderful. And the king is below her window because the queen had said previously in their sort of fencing fight that he used to come and sing outside her window that he was her white knight. And so he's below her window and she's like, oh no. And he starts singing badly and he's like, I love you more than the sea monster, which might have been my high point in the entire movie. He also sings We Made Babies Together. He tries to get the footmen to sing with him and they just sort of start trying to copy what he's singing, which is like, I love you and something. Ah. And he can't really figure out how to end the song. He's like, I'm sorry I was a... At which point, the queen starts singing. She has a beautiful voice. And she uh, sings that he's an opinionated... Unbelievably pig-headed numbskull. Yeah, and they end on this numbskull harmony, which... Okay. That pretty much summarizes the movie for you. Pretty much. Just that moment. And the king goes can I come up and she goes yes if you can get your armor off and I think that was like an implied sexy times maybe I it was a weird line it was a weird line I I don't want to read too much into it so we we cut back to Cinderella meeting with Queen Tatiana in the market Queen Tatiana has not left uh Cinderella is showing her a table full of uh designs and there's sort of a tense moment as queen is inspecting her designs tensely and there's tension it's tense and then Tatiana goes pack your bags and they're very excited I have concerns about her future me too the one dress that queen Tatiana saw was made by magic yep it was based on her design and her designs are the only thing she sees but she's never seen like a dress made by her. Yeah. She thinks she has, but she hasn't. Yeah. Also, uh, Tatiana, bless her heart, um, is a murderer. <laughs> yes, that too. And I don't hold that against her. I'll be very clear. I don't think that she is, that that's bad. I think she's fine. This podcast does not condone murder. It's always good when you have to say that. So Cinderella yells huzzah, which is a callback to earlier when the prince yelled huzzah and was like, oh, I've just heard a rich person say that once. So dumb. And then she gets introduced to the king and queen. Yeah, we just cut back to the palace and the prince is like, I want you to meet someone. And the king recognizes her as the statue girl. And she's like, no, that wasn't me. And he's like, no, no, that was. I have a very good memory for faces. And she's kind of like, oh, damn. (laughs) Which I thought was a funny moment. And the queen asks, so do I have a wedding to prepare? You know, no pressure or anything, but we have a lot of pastries left over from the ball. And they say that they're not in the rush and that they're not getting married right now, that they're going to travel the world together. The king is like, well, 
that's fine. I share blood with another who will be the greatest leader the world has ever known. Does the king say that? Or does he the does? Prince? He does. Yes. The king says that. Was that. The king. Okay. The prince good. goes. I'm sorry if this throws any uh, wrenches wrench in your plan in your plans for secession or something. And the king's like, No, no. I share blood with another who will be the greatest ruler. And then he goes, Gwen, stop listening. Which is sort of the the trope. And Gwen peeks out from behind another painting with the eyes cut out and goes, What? And she's announced to be first in line to inherit the crown. And then he asks her to please not stab him in his sleep. I loved that. I thought that was funny. And she that goes, was... I shall be king? And he goes, uh, queen. And she's like, I'll take it. Like, it just... And then she goes, so just so we're clear, I'm going to rule the land. Everyone heard that. I have so many ideas. And she kind of runs off and she's like very excited. Yeah. So uh, we then cut to a balcony and um, future Queen Gwen is giving a speech and part of it is to you know my brother Robert and his new and then she pauses in the middle of the speech like this isn't something that she'd thought of beforehand which for a character as smart as she is played up to be is absurd and she just turns to the new couple the prince and Cinderella and goes what are we calling you and then they have this whole oh we're not we don't really need to put a label on it we're just we don't need to put a label on it it's not we're just we're just in love I don't know yeah, yeah. Well, she Gwen, goes, well, just on love. And he's like, you love me? And she's like, yeah, I love you. I don't it, know. It's very, like, wrong time, wrong moment, wrong mood. It's, it's played to be cute. It's not cute. I don't, I don't like that trope of, I don't want to put a label on this. I just, let's just play. I don't like that. Anyway, so she introduces you know her brother Robert and his new love Ella and then we see like the crowd and his friend the guy whose name is Hench is like basically in tears yeah and then Gwen gives back the the brooch to Cinderella and says you know I hope this will inspire you or something and it's cute at which point the king goes all right we're finished now we're done having fun that's enough mirth and the queen goes, no, you're wrong. And it's clear that they'd planned this for the look that they had shared. It was clear that this was a healing moment for them that they had planned together. Oh, I didn't get that at all. I thought oh, that was I, a spur of the moment thing. No, I absolutely got that they planned it. Because they, they share several glances that are like, he oh, wanted to- it much better. Okay, I got that. Because there's no reason that he would say that. He likes fun, he likes stuff. I think that he had planned that specifically to give her the opportunity to publicly- have the chance to tell him that he's wrong in public which is the thing that she had complained about specifically mm -hmm. and then we get another song yeah. i just started hitting my keyboard at this point my notes stop being chaos and all caps and literally devolve into i just was hitting my keyboard with my fists it's let's get loud so it's one of those big group numbers where everyone's singing and dancing and a little girl starts drumming on everything it basically goes on for a really long time, but the important thing is at one point, Cinderella faces down her, her stepmother and she kind of sings directly at her that life is meant to be fun and the stepmother sort of sings back to her. Okay, but the line is, life is meant to be fun. You're not hurting anyone. Let the music set you free. I would like to posit that the stepmother did a great deal of harm. Yes. The stepmother's also wearing hot pink. And then they start to sing. They continue to sing the Let's Get Loud song. There's lots of fancy breakdancing that's happening at this point. It's physically very talented. I don't like it. We I tuned out at this point. I was just so emotionally done. I got I subtitles. Like... The subtitles at this point go, whoop, grunting methodically, yells, whoops. <laughs> so... We end with the fairy godparent a voiceover who goes, we've reached the end of this fairy tale and everyone knew her name. It was Ella. Her name was Ella. Get it right. And then we're done. We're blessedly finally done with this it was chaotic so introduction to our second season. 
Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. We miss you. But not this. Kind of this. I really did miss watching Cinderella, although I did hate this one. So, highs and lows? Oh boy. Um, I, I like the prince and his terrible dare do well friends. I thought that was kind <laughs> of a high for me. I thought it was funny when they were on screen. I liked it when the prince was being kind of bratty and was like, well, I don't, I don't want to be a prince. I don't, I don't want to have to do things. And I'm very busy hunting and getting drunk. Yeah, I, yeah, that's fine. My low is going to be the majority of the mice antics. Yeah. It was just really obnoxious. It was bad. It was bad. It interrupted the flow of the movie and it wasn't funny. And most of the time, my feelings about the mice were very negative. How about you? What were your highs and lows? God. If you can, if you can. I don't even know where to start. I gotta say, I liked how the prince responded to her immediate needs and agreed with her when she and accepted her decisions when she said, you know, I'm not choosing you. I'm choosing me. I, I thought that that was very healthy and lovely. Mm hmm. I think my high though is actually just the brief two second moments where there was just a dramatic cello solo. Oh, that was very cool. That was I a genuine, it. I was genuinely happy in that moment. Um, I wasn't, I was familiar with almost none of these songs. I was familiar with somebody to love, what a man, and that's it. I was not familiar with any of these songs other than that. So I, I didn't have like an emotional attachment to any of them, but that one cello solo, I was like, oh, that's, that's fire. Mm -hmm. I, that's a, that's a bomb cello solo. I love it. The lows. <sighs> yeah. I hated the mice. I hated the attempt to shoehorn a character into the stepmother in the last 20 mm. minutes of the movie. Just no, we're going to give you a reason for being mean and we're going to make you a person that we care about. No. The time to do that is earlier. Mm -hmm. You need to put touches of that throughout. Angelica Houston had a very traumatic moment when her husband died. We got a very strong view of her as a person experiencing loss and trauma and sadness and betrayal early on. She, she also didn't whoop out an entire backstory. Yeah, no. She, you got, she made one comment that you could interpret a certain way. Yeah, you got hints of it and she just acted it really well. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of really strong singers in this, which I liked. I just, I hated all the songs. I don't think there was a single song that I enjoyed. I, I think the original song in this movie, the Million to One uh, song, I think it was fine. I think they played it in the correct amount of times for me to get used to it and kind of recognize it when it came up, but not enough that it got really worn out. Okay, I, I agree with all of the things that you just said. And I think my problem here was that I did have subtitles. And so I was looking at, if it's a million to one something something, it's a shot in the dark, I'll still be the sun. I'm not afraid, even if I'm wrong. And I was just like, I, I can't, my brain, it hurts so much. Okay, so... Did I already do lows? I did lows. I did lows. So what would you change about this movie? I would rearrange it. Like I was saying earlier, I think that the moment where they realize that they can't be together has to come after the whole shoe business because it's, mm -hmm. it just takes all the like importance out of the finding her because she already said no. Absolutely. Agreed. What about you? So this is just a very much a me personally thing, but I would set it in a single decade. <laughs> just decide what if you want to make an entirely new world that's completely fine decide where that world is on the industrial revolution scale and just stick with it it doesn't matter what it is i don't care where it's set it can be completely fictional your costumes can be made up and out of nowhere and mixed with a bunch of things but just pick where you are in the industrial revolution timeline and then just stick with it i hated it it made me so mad it took me out of it every time i saw a 1930s milk pail and a 1940s sewing machine and a 
1300s dress and a 1700s bodice and an 1880s skirt and a 19th I, just, I hated it it made me so mad I couldn't get invested because I kept getting distracted by what in God's name was happening with the timeline here I didn't so much mind the hodgepodge of the costuming which was bad enough that even I could tell that it was all over the place I really minded when they used really modern language where they were like that's cray or that's hopping or whatever where it was both like too modern and also already a little stale yeah our our biggest question that we had for one another during this process y'all was who was this made for Mm -hmm. because it is it is not adult enough to be for adults and it is not childish enough to be for children so who was this for is it for us did they make it for us if they had i wish it if i had if they did i wish they wouldn't have because there were other things that we like more we just we know what we like we like the 1976 czechoslovakian cinderella we like the uh the weird russian stuff and like julie andrews things this this isn't it <laughs> this isn't what we like we're into the weirder stuff oh so talent will you ever be watching this again Oh, absolutely not. You couldn't <laughs> pay me to. Or I mean, I guess you could pay me to, but it would be like a lot of money. How about yeah. you? Yeah, no, absolutely not. Uh, no. I, I routinely watch terrible, trippy things over and over again with my friends. Um, I recently watched something called Howard Lovecraft and the Frozen Kingdom, which has two sequels and it was horrific. And I'm going to be watching it. I'm going to be watching it multiple times with all of my friends when they're high or on shrooms. I'm going to trip sit them and it's going to be fabulous i will never watch this again yeah it's bad it's just it's not good and there's nothing in it that i think i would want to experience again absolutely not um do you think our listeners should watch this no yeah no absolutely not this Guys, wasn't don't fun. watch it like it's I'm not so, good i'm so sorry we wanted to like this we really i really, we, I really hoped it would be good i really I was, did i was really excited i saw the first um brief you know preview i was excited and then i saw some longer previews and i was going maybe they just put all the worst moments into the previews like you did with previews where you put all the worst parts in and it gets better in the movie (sighs) all right final grade time final grade i think i think it's a d plus for me okay it just it wasn't good structurally it wasn't an enjoyable experience it was so long. It had 14 individual songs, at least. It was just too much and not enough of it was good. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm going with a with a D because there were a couple of moments that I liked, although they tended to ruin those. I liked what they were trying to do. They failed to do it. Here's why I don't understand. How did this fail to be a Cinderella? Because this had no father, an evil stepmother, two evil stepsisters, a ball, a fairy godparent, a prince, magic, and somehow this failed to be a Cinderella. It was like Camille Cabello stumbled into a different movie uh, that had a Cinderella-shaped space in it and just wandered in and out of it. It was extremely weird because... I. This wasn't a Cinderella somehow. No, because her dream wasn't to go to the ball. She had to be convinced to do it. Maybe that was the problem. Because what she wanted was to own a business, which, I mean, capitalism, but okay. Uh, All right. I need to fix myself my first adult beverage of the evening because I've absolutely not had one until now. And we're going to talk about this more in the Ever After Party. So I hope I, you can join us there. We I hope you can cuz I have to go get something else to drink. I mean something first to drink. <laughs> and another cookie. Well, it's almost midnight, so thank you for joining us. If you <laughs> liked it is actually almost midnight. Yeah. <laughs> if you liked this episode, please leave us a rating or a review. We'd love to hear from you. So follow us at Cinderpod on Twitter and Instagram, like our Facebook page, or email us at the Cinderella Podcast at gmail.com. If you want bibbity bobbity bonus episodes or to hear us discuss this week's Cinderella, but with more adult questions, language, and beverages, 
Join us on the Ever After Party at patreon.com slash cinderpod. Our intro music is Bad Ideas by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. So Liv, what are we watching next week? Ha, huh. I don't know why you say we, Talon. Next week, you are going to watch uh, A Trap for Cinderella by yourself. Oh, oh boy. Is it too spooky for Liv? This is a horror Cinderella. It is way too scary for Liv. I looked at it and I read the synopsis and went, no, thank you. So what's going to happen next week is for our the first of our two Halloween spooktaculars, uh, Talon is going to watch the first one and tell me about it and I'm going to react to it. And um, then we'll watch our actual Halloween spooktacular together. And um, we'll see how that goes. I might not be able to watch that one either because I'm a wimp. It is going to be an experience. Halloween Cinderella's. I didn't realize there were going to be Halloween Cinderella's when I started this. Well, until then, we hope you have a happily ever after.